Excellent, Mr. Chair, I see us live on YouTube. Excellent, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Transportation Committee for Wednesday, March 3rd, uh, 2021. We have uh, a few items uh, that are up for final action today, a few others that we'll be voting uh, to draft and a uh, public hearing that will begins at 11 a.m. If for any reason uh, that we have to continue beyond our scheduled start of the JF of the um, uh, public hearing this morning, we will recess at the moment we are at and then reconvene the meeting at the close of the public hearing. So votes or conversations that need to take place, they'll take place at the close of the public hearing this evening. Uh, that's only if we, for some reason, have to go beyond um, the next 40 minutes or so. Um, the, uh, I'm trying to see if Senator Cassano has been able to jump on yet. It does not appear so. Um, with that, uh, did Representative Carney or Senator Summers have any opening remarks? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see everyone today. I, I look forward to... Um, a robust discussion on, on some of these items. Uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of hard work that's gone into uh, these legislation, these pieces of legislation and a lot of good conversations uh, that you and I have had with Senator Cassano and Senator Summers on these topics. So, so thank you. Thank you, Senator Summers. I'm all set. I just will echo the uh, sentiment of the ranking member that I look forward to the discussion on these bills. There's been a lot of hard work and thought that has gone into them. I know there are some questions in certain areas, but I'm confident that we can work through it uh, to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Summers. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item number three, bills for final action. Uh, before us are three bills for final action. Uh, as we know in the committee process, uh, all bills for final action do require a voice vote. Um, I'm sorry, a roll call vote. Um, and we take them up individually uh, at this time. So starting with number one, HB 5429. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. A motion made by Representative McCarthy Vehi, seconded by Representative Sims. Uh, is there a discussion on the bill? If not, I will kick off. Um, as, as, as we know, um, this issue has come to us over the past years in the Transportation Committee. It is uh, an omnibus bill with numerous protections uh, for pedestrians and drivers in the wake of what we've seen across the state of Connecticut and frankly, uh, the entire country, which is a dramatic increase in the number of uh, pedestrian and vulnerable user fatalities uh, that uh, are oftentimes a direct result of increased rates of speed, larger profile vehicles, and distracted driving. Um, we had a robust public hearing to kick off the year. In fact, the first uh, bill-based public hearing in the uh, Zoom era for the Connecticut General Assembly, in which we had over 70 members of the public testify uh, and many more who submitted testimony overwhelmingly in favor of this bill. Uh, in the uh, testimony for that bill and in the conversation amongst committee members uh, during that day, there are a number of issues and thoughts and ideas that arose. And so uh, as in screening and amongst uh, our team and, and the transportation committee, we've looked at ways that we could even improve upon that bill. And you have JFS language before you uh, that attempts to get in. Uh, you should see JFS LCO 4382, which was distributed to the committee uh, in advance, um, as well as an OLR summary uh, before you. Uh, and it, it highlights the changes we're making to the crosswalk law to bring us into uh, greater uh, conformance with a national standard. It establishes a Vision Zero Council, uh, which would help us determine how we can, in Connecticut, begin to design our roadways to ensure that there are zero fatalities uh, or severe injuries. Um, we make uh, modifications to uh, the Office of Traffic and Safety Administration traffic impact studies saying you have to consider the impact on bike and pedestrian uh, facilities when you're generating, doing a traffic generating development. Uh, we've created anti-dooring legislation in accordance with most other states across the country. Uh, we actually took advice from the ACLNU on how to tighten that language up. Uh, we increased 
uh, the surcharge that a local municipality will receive on certain motor, motor vehicle violations from 20 to $25. Um, similarly, we uh, allow municipalities to establish uh, lower speed limits and pedestrian safety zones. And we increased the fines for uh, distracted driving. Uh, we codified our existing regulatory fees for greenway plates and we require that portion that's not reserved for DMV's administrative costs to be dedicated into a, a dedicated account for DEEP's grant programs for greenways, bikeways, pedestrian walkways, and recreational trails, really making sure that we're spending the money the way we said we were uh, when we issued these plates. Uh, and we established two programs, pilot programs for speed cameras, one in maintenance work zones, the other in school and hospital zones. Um, and I think we took a lot of input from the public on how to make those programs uh, more uh, constrained, but more beneficial to traffic safety. Uh, since the public hearing, we've looked at ways to uh, really tailor that program, uh, limit it to certain municipalities, like you can have up to 10 municipalities, uh, up to 12 zones total. So we don't see these all over the state. We won't see them every intersection in, in all the states. We're going to require municipalities to go through engineering studies to evidence the uh, traffic uh, safety components that need to be addressed to ensure that's a high accident uh, high crash rate uh, location. Uh, we're dedicating those revenues not towards a municipality's general fund, but instead towards traffic improvement. The revenues that are generated from these cameras must be spent on traffic safety. Uh, this is not and should not be construed as a revenue generator for local communities. This is about improving pedestrian safety. Uh, and we uh, make it a time limited uh, uh, pilot program where we have reporting deadlines and, and requirements of municipalities to ensure that uh, the program is working as we designed. And so I think we have before this committee a robust traffic safety piece of legislation that accomplishes so much of what the committee has worked on over the years. Uh, there still be work on this. I will be working with uh, Representative Carney, Senator Summers, Senator Cassano in, in screening to make sure it's tailored even more. And with anyone uh, who has any thoughts or ideas about how to improve this moving forward, I do believe the committee process has served us well and we have a, a great piece of legislation before you. And with that, open up to any questions. I do. Uh, I said represent, Representative um, Zawistowski. Representative Carney, did you, uh, hold on, did you? I did, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, Representative Carney, then Representative Zawistowski. Yes. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your uh, uh, summary of the legislation. It is it's pretty extensive legislation. I just, I, I do have a few questions um, regarding some of the sections within it. Uh, the first one is um, regarding the dooring in section four. Would this, would the infraction only occur if there's actually a physical contact with a pedestrian or a cyclist? So for example, if, if I have my door open and nobody hits it, uh, I, I cannot, a police officer can't give me an infraction for that, correct? That is correct, Representative Carney. Okay. Um, and then regarding um, the municipal speed limit section, is there a, a, a limit um, that towns would have to follow with that? Is there a specific speed limit that a town can't go below? Yes, uh, I believe it's 15 miles per hour. Okay. Um, all right, and then regarding the, the speed camera section, I guess my, my first question that a lot of uh, my colleagues were wondering is, I guess you could do for, you know, look at both sections, but who's going to pay for the speed camera program? Uh, it would be the local municipality that determines to erect those cameras um, or the state of Connecticut's Department of Transportation if they determine to use them uh, at locations uh, on the on the highways. Okay, is, is there any process for selecting the towns that would participate in the school and hospital zone pilot program? Uh, I think it would, it would be a DOT would working to develop the um, 
standards and ensure compliance with, I'm sorry, uh, maybe Katrina, could you help? Uh, if you don't mind, Representative Carney, I might have um, our LCO and OLR weigh in on this one. I believe we settled on uh, DOT uh, helping to determine if the requisite uh, background has been accomplished by each community, if they have a, a place where they can where they can dedicate the revenue. So if you could describe that section a little bit more detail, that'd be great. I think I think the one answer to one question was OPM is is tasked with the municipal pilot program. So if the the language isn't specific to how OPM will design that, but um, it it's not written as a mandate to a municipality to participate. But, but there's there's no I guess there's nothing in the legislation that specifies um, the size of the town, the, the makeup, you know, in terms of uh, pedestrian safety areas or more uh, congested areas that have to participate. No. OK. Um, OK. Uh, regarding uh, the speed camera section. So a lot of my uh, uh, members of my caucus had had concerns regarding obviously what happens if somebody is, um, two things, I guess, if somebody is uh, cited for an infraction and they were not driving the vehicle, what are their options if that's the case? Thank you, Representative Carney. That's an issue that's come um, There are numerous defenses uh, available to an individual. Um, legally, I think it's better if I allow Ms. Stratton to answer some of that specifically, but one of them is actually um, your, your, will, your ability to just say it wasn't me um, and be uh, able to challenge that ticket. So Ms. Stratton, could you provide greater legal analysis on the available opportunities for uh, ability to actually, challenge? Actually, I think you said it well. Okay. I guess, is there, is there any opportunity then, because if like, say I get an infraction um, and you know, my, I lent the car to my friend, uh, and I, is there, would there be an opportunity for me to actually see what the camera provided or what, what photo or video the camera um, took? Yes, the way these programs work is a picture is generated of the vehicle at the time of infraction and that is mailed to you. Um, and you can uh, challenge that uh, by going to your local municipality saying, it wasn't me, I was not uh, driving the vehicle at this time. Okay. Do you know if if uh, a vehicle is cited for an or a vehicle's owner is cited for an infraction? If because I know the the police or emergency services is is going to be the one reviewing the cameras and sending out those infractions. If I'm correct, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Do you know if if then say for example somebody has a criminal record or an, like an outstanding warrant or something like that whether that camera image or that infraction could be used then to go and apprehend that individual? Uh, thank you for the question. It was a very specific question it was actually raised during um, some information gathered after the public hearing from the ACLU as well. And I think we spent some time uh, trying to work on that language. Uh, Ms. Stratton, could you help uh, illuminate that issue a little bit? Or Heather, Heather, do you? Uh, do you have... So I think that is, I, I think it is outside the scope of the bill and we would probably have to do a more detailed analysis of other laws that may be implicated. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I wouldn't want to speculate without more time. Okay. All right. No, I just, it's something we probably just need to, to figure out what that process would be and how extensive it has to be. I mean, obviously if somebody's wanted for murder, you know, you'd, you'd hope the, the police would then go and, and apprehend that person if they're able to. Um, yeah. But, Representative Carney, it, it is a, it is a valid point about how this data and the images are used. We want to be really, um, really cognizant of potential misuse, right? So we're, we've tried to limit 
uh, the applications where any of this information can be used uh, beyond the scope of the program. And so uh, it is worth considering as we move forward exactly how we ensure that the limits we put in place are relevant to just the just the infractions that we're concerned about. Okay. Um, and I, I guess my last question is specifically regarding the school zone piece of it. Would, would these cameras, as far as you know now, would these cameras be on um, just when school is in session? So for example, if um, during, you know, during the summer, nobody's going to, you know, going to a specific middle school or an elementary school, would the town still be able to use those cameras in that situation? Yes, they would be allowed to use them uh, even during hours when school is not in session. Uh, school activities are often uh, local gyms uh, for after hours or PTO meetings or summer school locations or a uh, variety of activities take place in and around uh, schools that we thought was important that they uh, deserved year-round uh, consideration. Okay, because I think one of the things, I mean, not, not every school zone is like this, but I know there are some school zones where the speed limit actually changes when school, when they're, when kids are going, you know, in school or coming and going to school. So I guess would be, you know, have to hope that the camera then, if they are there at that particular school district, the camera then would adjust for when that speed limit changes. So I don't know if the, I'm sure the technology can do it, but it's just something I was thinking about. Yeah. And, and we really want to be cognizant of that. And so that's why we're we, we pushed out the implementation date a little bit because we want to make sure DOT has time to develop um, a lot of these regulations in, in use on these programs to make sure that they're hitting all of these specific traffic concerns. Um, and then limiting the pilot program to uh, just 10 municipalities allows us to ensure that we've tailored that program uh, meaningfully and it's not uh, broadly applicable without consideration for the very unique circumstances where a camera would be utilized. Um, so I think that's, you know, we're, we're getting towards that. I think, I think we're there, but if we need to look at some of those regulations in more detail, I'm certainly open to that. Okay. And I, I'm sorry, I thought of one other question. And I guess if, if, I, if I receive an infraction um, and I don't pay it and I don't do anything, would there, there be higher penalties or potentially a criminal offense that I would face by not doing that? Uh, no, there would not be. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I, I appreciate, I, I appreciate, um, your answers and I appreciate your, your hard work on this legislation. Uh, you know, I do have some concerns regarding the speed camera section. I know some of my colleagues do for purposes of today though. Um, I am going to vote to support the bill out of committee. Um, but I, and I know we will continue to work on this language before uh, it hits the floor. So again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for all your hard work and for your collaboration on this topic. Thank you, Representative Carney. Uh, next hand I see is Rep Representative hey. uh, Zawistowski and then Representative McCarthy Vahey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I took my hand down before. So um, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, there's a lot to like about this bill. There's a lot of things that will certainly help pedestrian safety. Um, but I, as always, I look through the lens of, of unintended consequences. And I wanna thank Representative Fart Carney for bringing up a lot of the areas that I had questions about concerning Doring and also uh, some of the items on the speed cameras. Um, I have one that, that uh, on the, uh, the section that will require cars to park 25 feet from marked crosswalks. I just had a question on that. Um, you know, what is, I, I get why that's in here with the rest of, with, considering the rest of that part portion of the bill. Um, but um, it, how is this consistent with what other states are doing, what we're, how it's compared to what we're doing now? And does it have the potential to hurt some of our small urban businesses that are, that have that may be using these spots for parking and it's specifically your district might be affected by this um and i just wanted to make sure that wanted to compare it to what we're doing now um mr chairman thank you for the question and i believe we removed that section um from the jfs language um yeah i wanted to double check we removed that section from the jfs language due to very specific questions in that regard uh, raised by Senator Summers in our screening committee. 
Um, we'll have to relook at that section, I think, because uh, I think I think you, you nailed the, the you nailed it on the head there. Um, what is the national standard that we're trying to emulate? What is the very specific local impact? Uh, the legislation, as it's currently constructed, actually treats New Haven different than anywhere else in the state. So I wanted to spend more time on that section, and I didn't feel comfortable that we'd gotten there for the purposes of a JFS meeting. Um, and so I, I, we took it out uh, based upon that, that concern. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, gen generally, um, you know, I, I have some real issues with the speed cameras because I think it does open the door to, um, to red light cameras, other types of speed cameras, other types of surveillance. And I, I'm extremely uncomfortable with that. But uh, keeping in mind that I, I know that there is going to be additional work being done on this, uh, I am going to be voting in favor of this today, um, but uh, I may not, unless this section is, in, I, I'm, is, I'm just very uneasy about the speed cameras. I may not vote for it on the House floor, but I do would like to get it out of committee. I think it's got some very worthy items in it. And um, I'd like to at least see the, the, the good portions uh, proceed further. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative, and, and thank you for we, we, two of us have a great relationship working on issues uh, beyond committee as well. So I appreciate your trust that I will continue to work with you on these issues and, and our leadership team and screening to, to make this bill better. Thank and you. Mr. Chairman, uh, we're, not, uh, we're, we're not talking carrots and sticks on this one, even though we spent a lot of time talking about it previously. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Uh, Representative McCarthy Vehi, followed by Representative Zupkis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you and all those who have worked on this bill as someone who uh, met you immediately and coming in as a freshman working on these issues for vulnerable users. I think this bill is so critical and I know you all heard from so many of my constituents what it will mean here in my community locally, but for all of us throughout the state. And I had, just, I had a specific question um, related to section 17. We can pass laws, but until people change behavior, um, we and that's part of what this law is trying to do, uh, change infrastructure, enforcement, education, so that we can change behavior. And I would also like to you know, thank DOT for their willingness to engage in these conversations in a, in a different way at this point. And that kind of leadership is so important and we're seeing that at the national level also. Section 17 of the bill um, contemplates the development of a public awareness campaign to help the public become aware of the changes. Uh, for example, the crosswalk law, uh, as someone who's out walking frequently in the community or jogging, it's clear that our motorists um, who are in a vehicle, as I tell my teenage driver, your vehicle is essentially a weapon and that we need to, as drivers, be incredibly conscious of those vulnerable users. How, how exactly is that campaign going to be conducted and is this within available appropriations or will there be any additional funds to uh, conduct such a campaign? Thank you for the question. And, and frankly, this is something I think, I, I feel the best about uh, post public hearing is recognizing that you can develop these programs locally and you can put up cameras in a program. You can generate revenue for a short window of time, um, but the pilot programs end and uh, the uh, amount of revenue doesn't necessarily um, change behavior beyond that window of time we're considering this program. And what can we do with those dollars that is, that is better for the state of Connecticut? Uh, and so we, um, are going to require DOT to develop and implement a public awareness campaign. It won't be unique to Connecticut. There are other states across the country that are doing this. And uh, the directive on that is to reduce transportation related fatalities. Um, talk about how the speed cameras are being used so people know that they're there. Um, how do you obey speed limits, the importance of it in work zones. That's all funded through the revenues that are generated by the speed cameras itself. Um, DOT currently has some funds uh, right now for public awareness campaigns, but we, we double down on that with some of the revenues here. And any of the dollars that, doesn't, that don't go to DOT uh, that are collected locally from these infractions, uh, they require those dollars to be used to improve traffic safety. 
so that uh, the revenues that are generated during this pilot program have multi-generational impact. Uh, and you can take the dollars that we raise from an 18 month to 24 month uh, increase in violations and redesign that intersection, uh, improve the crosswalks, improve pedestrian facilities, improve bike facilities across the entire city or town. Um, and to me, that is, that is what this as a successful program looks like. Not dollars for the general fund, lower towns need it, dollars for improving traffic safety and pedestrian safety for vulnerable users. That, that's what I think I heard from committee members um, talking about this bill. It's what I certainly heard from folks who testified that day. And I think it's the long lasting impact of this program is that we have a multi-generational benefit to the transportation and pedestrian safety in the state. Mr. Chair, thank you again for your consistent and persistent leadership on this issue. And I will continue to stand with you on this to help advance this for Everyone, everyone's a pedestrian in the end, whatever way you choose to travel. So thank you so much. I will be voting in favor and hope my colleagues will do the same. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Zupkis, Zupkis followed by Representative Morimbella. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, I, I, as my colleagues, I do have some concerns with the camera piece of this. Um, uh, one of which, you know, Representative Carney uh, spoke to, but what will happen if the police that monitor it, once they put in the license plate and there is a, uh, this person has a, a, an outstanding court date, a criminal, some kind of criminal um, history that hasn't been taken care of, what happens if they send the ticket to an address and the address, the person's no longer at that address. How do all of those things get addressed? Uh, thank you, Representative. Yeah, we touched on that a, a little bit uh, and maybe we can use more clarification in that language because the goal is to ensure that this data and images cannot be used for any other purpose that is uh, not articulated in the program rules. Um, and I think, uh, Ms. Stride, could you, could you go over some of that uh, as well, how it was written to sort of protect against? Well, the, the, the one thing I noticed from your question, Rep. Zuckus, is that the, the police officers aren't monitoring a camera. They're going to be looking at the pictures that the camera takes. So it's not, it's after the fact. And then they use their discretion whether or not they think a violation occurred and they mail it. Um, that part is specific right now in the bill. Um, but Wouldn't like- Wouldn't they though, if they ran the license? So I'm, I'm just, so they get a picture of the car and they have the license plates. And so that's how they would go in and find the address, right? Mm -hmm. So I would think when that license plate comes up and it says Leslie Zupkis, information would come up regarding Leslie Zupkis. And if some of that information, I guess I kind of see it as like when, when a car gets pulled over for speeding and they run the license plates or your driver's license, well, they wouldn't have your driver's license in this instance, but information would come up. And so if it was bad information, you know, we might want them to pursue this further. If it's, it, it, I guess it's depending on what comes up, out of what they discover. The, the bill doesn't contemplate uh, that situation. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm having a little trouble with that, I'll, um, I'll admit. My other question is, um, what is it going to cost our local police department? So I'll just use Cheshire, for example, because that's one of my towns that they chose to do this or um, after they have to do it. Um, the funds, um, I believe I heard, that are generated from the tickets um, are used for education. Is this going to retire? I mean, um, require more staff, different equipment that they have to use. Um, is the state employees more state employees in any way, shape, or form? What are those kinds of um, implications? 
Thank you. Yeah, there's been no indication that this would require additional staff at you know, the DOT or at the local level. Uh, the local communities who um, would consider this uh, and make an application to OPM would, would be able to consider that. We're not going to impose this on, on any community at all. Uh, this is not something that uh, we're going to volunteer the town of Cheshire for. Uh, the town of Cheshire would have to uh, develop their own um, um, application to OPM and they would be able to consider and balance uh, those choices locally. So, so the, the and I use Cheshire as an example because it's one of my I, towns. So did I, I saw <laughs> But oh, New Haven. So if New Haven chooses to do this, they understand the yeah. financial cost that it may be, that it, they may have to incur, I guess. That's is, right. Okay. That's exactly right. Um, and then my, my last question is, um, how is some of this going to be, because uh, I too am a cyclist and run and haven't so much lately, but run and walk and all. And so what happens, um, it almost to me sounds like it's going to come down to a he said, she said, because if I'm stepping out in the crosswalk and make a motion with my arm and, you know, the person doesn't slow down or what, or, you know, doesn't stop how is this all going to be monitored and um, decided? Yeah, the, the, is it all? The, um, with respect to the crosswalk law, there, I mean, this is not part of the camera program, right? Like the camera program is only evaluating speed and, yeah. and safety zones. So this is still based upon a uh, officer or witnesses uh, determining what happened at an event, right? Like that's still the same standard. Um, the, standard that changes is no longer does an individual have to physically walk into the crosswalk for a car to stop. Connecticut has an absurd current standard. Um, we talked about this before. Uh, the, the current put yourself into the roadway before triggering a car to yield to you. Uh, the standard in most states is the minute you approach a curb, the car is obligated to stop. We're in the middle. We've created a standard where you just have to, for, and then this is based upon committee conversations we've had in the past, where folks didn't feel comfortable having a curb standard. They wanted someone to affirmatively indicate their intent. So now you raise your hand, you have signaled your intent to cross and you're obligated to stop. It shouldn't matter because the moment someone hits somebody in a crosswalk, the person who's driving the car has committed an offense. Right, like they, they, they were obligated to stop them, you know, before they, they hit them and operate their car with due discretion and care. And all we're saying is that in order to trigger a yield, you just have to raise your hand and, a, and, and an, officer can, an officer can witness that someone has raised their hand um, and, and indicated their intent to, to proceed. Just one last and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, so if I am at a curb and I raise my hand and someone doesn't stop and I take my foot to step off the curb and they don't yep. stop, can I take a picture of the license plate and send it to the police? I mean, who's gonna, how is that? You cannot, you know, uh, it would have to be a witness. I mean, that's like, that. That we're not changing the law on that. We're not allowing individuals to uh, prosecute their own crimes on this, uh, but they're, you know, the standard is changing from when a car is obligated to yield the right of way to a, a pedestrian. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. All right, Representative Morimbello, followed by Representative Chafee, um, Representative Haynes, Representative Smith, Senator Martin, and we're going to have to uh, recess at that point, likely, um, to move to our public hearing. So, Representative Thanks. Morimbello. Thank you, Chair Lamar. I have one question. Um, it's about the speed camera section. In regard to the MOU, is it the intention to have one MOU for the entire pilot program? Um, or are multiple MOUs going to have to be signed for each individual work zone? Has that been ironed out? Uh, so the MOU, so based upon the public hearing testimony, it became clear that uh, both the highway workers themselves and the state police union um, would prefer there to be in these types of zones where people are traveling 75 miles an hour in a 55 unprotected area, they'd actually prefer the police presence um, when uh, appropriate. Uh, 
and over the cameras. The cameras are a very secondary desire in that respect. They, they would preserve police presence. And so we didn't want to have um, the cameras take the place of preferred officers. So if they're, if DOT can work with the state police union and the maintenance worker to determine locating sense uh, for there to be officers, then they don't put up cameras. Uh, so the, the MOU supersedes that. Uh, it can be specific to location or um, as, as a statewide policy. It, the, the legislation doesn't say it has to be one or the other. It just says you can't utilize the cameras where an MOU otherwise governs police presence. Okay, so the intention is then to uh, prioritize having an actual police officer at the site. If that isn't a, going to occur, then the cameras would be uh, a secondary option for that situation. That is correct, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Representative Chafee followed by Representative Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question was similar to Rep. Moore Bellows about the MOU. So I, I think that's kind of been clarified. I was just, is, is this MOU in existence now or is this something that they're gonna create in the future? There has been an MOU that DOT has signed into with the state police union um, with respect to when and where their presence is. I wanted to, I wanted to respect the testimony that we received at the public hearing, and but also bring in um, the union that represents uh, the folks who are doing this work on our highways to make sure that they are part of that conversation as well. Um, so th there have been MOUs that have been signed and, and discussed. I wanted to broaden that and, and make sure that it's in play uh, before we before we put up cameras. Thank you. Representative uh, Haynes, followed by Representative Smith. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to be here and discuss this bill. Um, first, I just want to say that I agree with my colleague, uh, Representative McCarthy Vahey, in that we're trying to do some legislation here that we really are trying to legislate human behavior. And I do have some concerns in regards to the crosswalks and the dooring um, parts of this bill in regards to um, the onus is really on the motor vehicle owner, not the walker, jogger, biker. Um, and at the same time, there is responsibility on their part that we need to um, you know, think about. And again, in, in agreement with Representative McCarthy Vahey, you know, that is obviously going to be in, um, uh, you know, public education, you know, what are we doing there in, in regards to that. But um, I do have specific questions regarding the cameras. I am a parent of a daughter who at midnight drove through a work zone that was closed down for the day, but the camera was still rolling and I got the ticket um, on somebody who was going, I don't know, 45 and a 35 work zone. Um, so I get it. And, um, you know, I have to say in work zones, I, I worry about our DOT workers. So I appreciate that part of the bill. The pilot, however, I just want to verify, you had mentioned, um, Chairman, that you verified that the, you mentioned the uh, municipality pays for the cameras. Is that not correct? Yes, that would be the program that we develop as the municipalities would, uh, you know, apply to OPM to be considered for one of these pilot programs. The, the standard would be that they would construct them, use the revenues to pay off uh, the installation of that program to pay off the administrative costs, and then the additional dollars would be utilized uh, for traffic safety uh, based uh, investments. Okay. And, and again, you know, just to verify what you just said, um, I imagine that because it's a pilot, we're still, the tick tickets will still be issued. And to that end, the revenue collected from those tickets, I'm hoping would first go to those municipalities to reimburse them for said yes. pilot and program and all that. Exactly, that's exactly right, yes. The, the, the revenues would be generated and collected locally. Um, uh, a portion of what would go to the DOT for uh, administrative costs, probably very small if any. DOT uh, has indicated that they already have a program ready to go on this. They might not need the revenues from this for that. And we could instead dedicate all of it to local municipalities. Uh, we dedicate uh, in that, that you must put it into traffic safety um, programs as well. But, but after, uh, frankly, after you pay off the administrative costs of constructing the program. Certainly, and, and I think right now, especially um, with the whole COVID and they're still reeling from that, um, you know, to put in a program like this and have municipalities be at a loss, um, I don't know how many people you're gonna actually get 
<laughs> you know, participating in the program as far as that goes. So um, thank you. I appreciate um, all the hard work you've done on this bill. Um, again, even though I do have concerns, I will be voting today in favor of the bill to get it at least through committee and looking forward to hearing even more tweaks that we can make to the bill to make it sure that it'll go through the house. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Smith, followed by, followed by Senator Martin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I also had a question with respect to, I think it's section 15, the um, the use of the speed control uh, light uh, uh, cameras in the um, maintenance work zones. Um, so I guess if I understand correctly right now, when, when it's not, possible to have a state police officer on the site, um, the uh, workers uh, are working without that additional layer of protection. Is that correct right now? Um, so yes, in most in almost all work zones, the difference between the construction zones and work zones, um, and almost all work zones across Connecticut right now, our workers are out there without the benefit of police protection. Um, so the goal of this is to provide that layer of protection either through an MOU, which would say an officer must be out there, mm -hmm. or through the use of this camera technology, uh, okay. presuming that that camera technology with its associated ticket and fine would cause better behavior for drivers. Right. Okay. Uh, and so, so I think the earlier version of the draft uh, had uh, um, had a date to have that operational, which was I think June of 2022, and now it's pushed yeah. out to January 2023. Um, so that just yep. extends that period of no protection for workers for an additional six months. Is there a really strong reason for that? Uh, no, not really. Uh, we can move it back if I can if we can determine that we can pull a program together in that in that time window. Uh, mm -hmm. The determination was really, it might be just hard to write the regs on that and to get everyone to the table. Um, to write this MOU. Um, so I was just giving a little bit more time for those negotiations to take place. Uh, mm -hmm. But hey, if we, if we can get the, if we can get the signed agreements, I'm more than willing to move it up uh, as we move forward after committee. But I just didn't get the sense that we could pull the program off in that way. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's a way to do it so that it's more, uh, you know, it, there's a little bit more wiggle room in there where it's, you know, no later than or no, you know, or by this yeah. date or no later than another date or something like that to sort of give some yeah, momentum good. to speed that up. Um, good. Thank you. Senator Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just have maybe just one or two questions uh, regarding the speed cameras. I know my caucus is probably going to have a good, good discussion uh, regarding this section in particular, but I guess, uh, does the language provide the, the number of intersections that are going to be in this pilot? Uh, let me phrase it another way, the question another way. So are there, is there a limitation to the number of intersections that a municipality can uh, participate, I guess, be included in that study? So if New Haven, for instance, uh, can they select two or three different intersections? Yes, the, the legislation before you allows up to 10 municipalities to be considered for this pilot program and limits it to a total of uh, 12 zones per town. Um, so like you can do, you know, not, not 12 cameras because you want like 12 intersections essentially that you can do per town. Okay, thank you. Uh, th the portion uh, that I had concerned, I know uh, Representative Zupkis addressed, but I, I see that the cost of maintaining this the storage of the that's going to be required uh, may be burdensome to a lot of municipalities so i'm sure that's going to be a big discussion is there is there any has there been any information provided to the committee or to to you uh regarding the cost of doing one intersection let's say to a municipality Yes, I received um, uh, conversations and testimony. Gosh, I, I want to, I, I don't know that it was at, actually submitted before the committee, so I don't want to misrepresent it, not knowing that I, 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 they might not have come before the committee. It might have been conversations I had over the course of the summer when I was uh, constructing the bill. Um, but, but we were able to determine that most speed camera programs uh, more than pay for themselves. 
uh, when you consider the administrative cost associated with um, the pro running the program and the construction costs associated with developing the program, uh, all this, the speed camera programs do end up paying for themselves. Um, so we ended up, you know, what do we do with that revenue? That was the secondary uh, conversation. After it pays for itself, where should those dollars go? Um, that was the, the bigger bulk of the conversation. And, that, and does that include the labor portion of it as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, I saw during the testimony, I mean, the number of those who testified were numerous. Most of them came from the New Haven area. It seems like this issue really pertains to New Haven. And, um, you know, I don't see this taking place in my, a majority of my communities that I represent. So, uh, and having been a city councilor uh, for four years, I'm just questioning why doesn't New Haven simply adopt its own ordinance and if they want to, to address this, and why um, wouldn't they do their own study instead of having the state of Connecticut do this? Um, so one, it's not just a New Haven issue. It's a state and national issue that we're seeing uh, dramatic increases in pedestrian uh, and cyclist fatalities and roadway, fatal roadway fatalities. Uh, New Haven, though has had uh, a series of high profile incidents that have raised this issue beyond um, one of numbers uh, that you see increasing on a ledger and instead uh, dramatic impacts on community members um, that have really been impactful in our community. And, and, and it's going to continue to happen across the state. And we heard from folks from uh, numerous towns that day uh, and, and I do think we want to afford just municipal options uh, if they want to take part in this program um, or any of the provisions of this. Uh, but beyond the cameras, we mostly modeled uh, model language across the country when it comes to the crosswalks, when it comes to uh, distracted driving, when it comes to speed limit controls. We're modeling really best practices across the country. Um, the speed camera part of it, you're right, it, like that's, that is more controversial. We've heard that today. Uh, New Haven uh, is in support of it, but you're right that Bristol might not be. And, and we wouldn't want to force Bristol to take part in this. Don't get me wrong. We, I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that uh, I, if Bristol doesn't want to do this, to do it. Um, so so I, I, it, that's why we're limiting the pilot program um, and making sure it's an application from the town to OPM to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, see that our time is about uh, done here and we have to move on to the public hearing. But before we close, do you think you could show us the proper way to uh, intent to cross? Can you show us that before we leave? Senator Martin, I, I certainly can. Um, look, if you are a, approach a crosswalk right now, what you can do is you can physically run into the middle of the road and that will trigger the car to stop. Or moving forward, you can just step to the crosswalk at the curb Raise your hand and you've signalized your intent to cross. If you had is, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> no problem. Um, we are going to have to recess this meeting until the close of the uh, public hearing. At, that, at the close of the public hearing, we will reconvene this meeting where we will take up with a motion on the floor uh, that has been seconded to consider uh, item number one on our agenda. Uh, we will continue to entertain questions and comments at that time on that, this issue before proceeding to the other uh, items on the agenda. With that said, um, the committee, do I need a motion to move into recess? I move to move us into recess. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> So the committee will stand uh, in all in favor. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. In that database okay. Helps us. okay, the committee is now in recess until the close of the public hearing, at which time we will reconvene on the item uh, before us. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I have a judiciary, I think at noon. So I'll be with the public hearing from now till noon. Will we get a notice when the transportation public hearing closes? Yes, um, 
uh, Mr. Clark, could you ensure that we are giving folks a, a, a positive window of time, maybe like 20 minutes from the close while we convene at the next hour mark? And, that, and that'll be, just, just to make sure folks know they're not missing the committee meeting. Yeah. Mr. Chair. And send out an email to alert members when we will be reconvening for the committee meeting. And just to make sure they will also receive a direct link to their email to come right back into this meeting. All right. Thank Great. you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Of course, Representative Conley. Building on what Senator Kissel said, I also have uh, the meetings. I'm sure everyone has a lot of meetings uh, today. Could we hold votes open just in case we're in uh, waiting to speak or in a, a conversation? So that way we can um, make sure we all get back. Yes, we will accommodate folks um, needs at that time. Thank you, Chair. All right, this meeting is in recess. I'd encourage everyone to jump over to the public hearing at this time. And uh, hopefully we won't find more new and creative ways to make the committee clerk's life uh, more challenging today. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Mr. Chair, I'm so sorry to ask. Uh, I've been juggling two. Uh, did I miss a voice vote? Uh, you did not, Rep. Michelle. You, you were here for the whole thing. Okay. 